This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. Being in the hospital can be frightening and stressful for a child, but medical play can make a real difference in their experience. Hi, I'm Tonya Caruso. Welcome to this UPMC HealthBeat podcast. And joining us right now is Kelly Gavel. She is a certified child life specialist in the pediatric intensive care unit at UPMC Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us and thinking of our team. Well, this is such an interesting topic, mm-hmm. and I know for so many parents, it's an important thing that they may not even think about heading into Mm -hmm. something. You work in the pediatric ICU, so you see very ill children. How does medical play play into that? And I guess first, let's define for folks what medical play is. So first, we'll talk about the PICU. So pediatric ICU. These kids need the most intense care. It's in the name. A lot of these kids come from really terrible traumas. So think car crashes, bicycle accidents. Medical play can really help deconstruct what is going on in their head. They may have had a ton of medicine, you know, pumped through their system to get their body stable after this. Medical play can help put the pieces back together. Why is my arm like this? Why is my leg hurting so much? What is on my head? Where did my hair go? A lot of this can help put those pieces together for a child. However, true medical play with a typical healthy developing child should be fun, therapeutic, and child-directed. So what we do in the ICU is I look at the child that I'm working with, I figure out, okay, their medication or their sedation, so that sleepy medicine that makes them really relaxed and they're not moving, once that's all lifted, okay, what do they remember? What might those common misconceptions be? How can we help that child cope immediately in the hospital? So we first like to orient kids to place time, what day it is, et cetera, and then answer those misconceptions. Some kids might not be able to communicate right away, Mm -hmm. so they may still have that breathing tube in their mouth. So we may need to get them a communication board first. I would ask those prompting questions. Are you wondering why your arm's up like this? Are you wondering why your foot feels like that? And most kids are yes, or they're blinking twice for yes. So at first just might be conversational. Let's just help you zone in to the place and time and where you are right now. What would you say is the baseline for assessing a child's fears and Mm -hmm. concerns? Mm -hmm. And then how do you really go about starting to do that and then to address them? So a lot of it is working with the medical team and seeing, hmm, what is going on in their brain? Did anything happen? Do they have a concussion or a TBI, traumatic brain injury? Also talking with the parents. So maybe a kid really loves Spider-Man. Okay, let's put Spider-Man in a cast and make Spider-Man look exactly like what the child is experiencing. So if the child has, you know, a wrap around their head from maybe some brain surgery, Spider-Man gets that. (laughs) So it's something using the kid's strengths and interests beforehand and bringing it into the hospital and saying, oh, look, Spider-Man also has this. But we wanna assess where was the child beforehand? What happened and did anything in that accident or trauma or injury, whatever that might be, did anything impact that child's development. So it really is a multidisciplinary approach, Mm -hmm. seeing how they're responding, et cetera, making sure that they're at that same developmental level. And if not, taking those steps back and saying, okay, let's see how we can do this. It might be pictures, it might be hand over hand, it might just be talking through this. It really does look different for every child. And so tell me about some of the work that you do in getting a child ready for a procedure Mm -hmm. or explaining to them Mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. And you've brought many friends along to help you illustrate this. (laughs) I have. So one thing, um, we had a patient recently who came in Uh, for a procedure and she was going to wake up with something different on her belly. So she was going to have a stoma and that she was going to need to use these bags. So oftentimes we'll bring things in and medical play is really supposed to be free and easy. But you know, oftentimes, especially in the ICU, we Mm -hmm. need to do some education with it as well. So either preparation or debriefing after a procedure. So medical play in its true sense, there are no rules. However, in the hospital, you do want to guide sometimes the conversation, so that's more guided medical play. Mm -hmm. So I would bring 
this cute bear. Cute little bear. <laughs> it's For those of you listening to the yes. audio version, describe yes. what this bear it has. It is a little stuffed bear. It has a stoma. It's actually made out of model magic, and, and then we what colored is a stoma? it. So a stoma is basically an opening. So this would be where poop would come out. Um, and then this bag is where the poop would go. So we have all different children's books about how people go to the bathroom differently and things like that. But this would be an example of one of the things that we could do um, and do the bag changes. And then free medical play would be bringing a stethoscope or the thing that they look in your ears or the lights um, and allowing the child to maneuver all of this and construct a conversation that is child driven. So they might look at this flashlight, but they'd be like, oh, it's a drum. And they might start tapping it. Oh, or this is the bag. And they might start using, they might put beads or they might put whatever they want in the bag. You're right, it does, it collects stuff. It's gonna collect stuff that comes out of your body. So we can guide those misconceptions. Mm -hmm. You know, you could turn this into an art project. Right. You know, you could use this for all sorts of different things. So medical play is a way for a child to see things that are going on in their body or on their body, but do it in a really free manner that they can create and explore all of these pieces on their terms. Right. And so is play a really good way to express fear, concern, mm -hmm. to communicate? Yes. Another example would be this. We'll bring out my trach and G-tube friend. So this bear was actually created by Tubi Friends. It is an organization we have a partnership with. Um, and these are real medical equipment, you know, these are real devices mm -hmm. that are sewn basically into the bear so that they don't move. That does not happen in a child's case. But in the instance of a bear that has stuffing, that is how it stays in place. But bringing a bear in like this for a sibling, so maybe their sibling on the ICU just got a trach and a G-tube. What we would do is meet them in a non-threatening place in the hospital. I would bring my trach and my G-tube bear with a bunch of other things. I would bring my stethoscope or a real one. I might bring a play syringe, a real syringe, <laughs> and we might just talk about it. You know, I brought right. these things. Maybe I brought some paint and some bubble solution. We might do syringe painting. We might do syringe bubble blowing. What you would do, you would just suck up the bubble solution or the paint into the syringe and then you can just squirt it. <laughs> and it really is just to get them comfortable. Comfortable, yes, exactly. And this bear might be there. They might look at it like, oh, you know, what's going on with this bear? And I would say, what do you see on the bear? I think the bear is really soft. He's really good for hugs. Hmm, like, what do you see? I'm gonna say, oh, what's this thing on his neck? And I would say, that's a good question. Have you ever seen this before? I always like to assess a child's understanding. What do they think it is? Right. They might know. Right. And they say, oh, I actually think that's the G-tube. And we mm -hmm. were talking earlier, you said there are certain terms that can confuse children. Yes. And you make a point of really using language to explain mm -hmm. things. And tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Yeah, so we always like to be truthful. We always like to call it what it is. So if a kid is hearing that they're getting an IV, they might be, oh, like I have IV on my house. You know, like someone, like a gardener just came by or like, you know, my dad is trying to get the IV off the house. Like, why is there IV, like how to grow on my brother? They might be so confused, it's like, oh, right. hold on, we're gonna call it a straw. A tracheostomy is an, is an opening in your trachea. A trachea is this is how someone is going to breathe, that they're gonna use their trachea instead of their mouth. We like to call it what it is. A G-tube is helping get medicine right into someone's stomach. We like to be honest with kids right. because I've seen some parents, and out of the goodness of their heart, they make a nickname for whatever it is, it might be their cancer diagnosis, they might call it something else. And that might be really confusing because another kid, you know, they might be playing up in the playroom and they're like, I'm here to get my Lily injection. They might be like, oh, my name's Lily, what do you mean? So you don't wanna misname something because that can cause a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. It's always out of usually the goodness of someone's heart, they don't wanna call it what it is, but call right. it what it is. So then what sort of conversations do you have with young patients when they are expressing fear? I always like to have it in a non-threatening way. And I might just make a story up and be like, you know what, another kid, they were a little bit worried about moving units. You know, they didn't know who was going to be up there. Or, you know, my friend down the hall was telling me earlier, they're afraid to walk right now. 
there anything that you're afraid of right now? Because I know sometimes that can, this whole place is a little scary. And also empathizing, you're in a room full of strangers. People are touching your body in different places. It's really uncomfortable. And just stating that out loud, man, if I was here, this would, this would make me uncomfortable. Is there anything that has made you uncomfortable here? And just guiding that right. conversation. And what does that opportunity provide them? Mm -mm. And can you instantly then reassure them? What does that process typically look like? A lot of it is validation and a lot of validation for the families too. You would never imagine having these conversations with your four-year-old in your wildest dreams. You know, it's been pretty status quo for most of our kids until something happens or a diagnosis happens or a trauma happens and then the world has changed. So validating, this is not where you plan on being on a Wednesday morning, not at all. I cannot imagine how you're feeling. I'm here to help you. What can I help you with? Some kids want to know what movies we have on TV. Other kids want to know what floor am I on? Sometimes kids come in in such a rush mm -hmm. and sometimes they don't remember everything. So trying to orient them, you're on the fifth floor. You're in room 502. My name is Kelly and trying to orient them that I am here to help you. It's okay to be scared here. There are a bunch of strangers. You know, kids are conditioned, stranger danger. You know, your body is your body. No one right. can touch your body without your consent. You know, all of this stuff. And all of a sudden people are in here, you know, there's stuff's on your chest and right. it's on your back. And you might be an older child. You might be 12 years old, but you have to wear a diaper. Or a child that was learning how to be potty trained is now back in diapers. All of this stuff is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Right. Validating it and kind of calling out that elephant in the room can be really helpful. Is there an age group that is particularly challenging? I mean, with younger kids, you can pull out stuffed animals mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Spider-Man and he's doing this, he's doing that. Yeah. What does that look like when someone is 12 or 13 and going through something? Each age group kind of has its own challenges. So for the infants, a lot of it is they just want to be with their trusting adult. So however we can do that is going to be really beneficial. In the NICU, getting that skin to skin and being able to hug your baby. You know, you want to just physically touch them. You're working on that attachment. Then we have our toddlers who are like wild. <laughs> and they're trying to like, I want to do this and no, and no is their favorite word all of a sudden. And they want to run out of the place, trying to contain them <laughs> in a mm -hmm. safe place. And you have all these lines. <laughs> So, I mean, each age group really has their own challenge and difficulty, but getting to know your kid, you might have a four-year-old who has no problem. You know, they might act, you know, as if they're 12 years old, mm -hmm. but they are four. But then you may also have a 12-year-old who regresses a little bit. There might be like bedwetting when they go home or something like that. Then you have your teenagers who are like, I'm missing prom. You know, right. they might not have a care in the world about their diagnosis or the G-tube that they just got. They're like, no, I was supposed to take my driver's license test yesterday, and now I'm here. How important do you feel these conversations are and, and how ultimately medical play plays into a child's experience mm -hmm. and successful treatment? So everything is about positive coping. So what we really like to instill in children is that they can do this, that we believe in them, that they can do this dressing change. They can have their port accessed. They can you know, get their central line dressing cleaned, or maybe something's coming out that they've had for a really long time. Being truthful and having an open-ended conversation is really, really helpful. It really depends on what is happening. Mm -hmm. So if a child is approaching the end of their treatment, what is that transition going to look like? Having those conversations at home, you know, you're going in for your last X treatment. How are you feeling about it, you know? And the parents can model that, that vulnerability. You know, like, I'm, I'm a little nervous, you know, that we're not going to be at the hospital every week. Are you feeling nervous about anything? How would you like to say goodbye or see you soon to your team? Mm -hmm. We see that a lot in the ICU. People get really comfortable with our nurses and our staff being there all the time. The doors are glass, so you can look out and just wave and ask people to come in. So starting those transitional conversations can be really helpful and modeling for kids because uh, sometimes they don't have the words. Mm -hmm but looking to a trusted adult, whether that's mom and dad or a nurse that they know really well, respiratory, child life, whoever that is, you know, saying, I'm really gonna miss you when you go upstairs. I believe that you can have these coping skills when you go upstairs and when you go home, that you can do this. I might be doing a trach change at home and the parents have been learning for months and months and months and they can do it. So not only do we work with the kid on keeping their legs still and tilting their head up so that 
so they have a good view of the site and all of that. But it's also the parents that they have learned the tools. And it's a lot about self-efficacy. You know, you can do this. We believe in you, but you have to believe in yourself too. Right. Yeah. I can tell you absolutely love your job. What is your mm -hmm. favorite thing about your job? It's the best thing because you see kids come in and it is absolutely like crisis time, traumatic time. Oh my gosh. And now they're walking out of here or wheeling out and out of here. And it is remarkable. Right. It's the best part. And you've certainly played an important part in that mm -hmm. recovery and treatment. We thank you so absolutely. much for coming in and thank spending you. time with us today. Some great information. We appreciate mm -hmm. your time. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. I'm Tonya Caruso. Thank you for joining us. This is UPMC Health Beat.